Welcome everyone to this talk. Thanks for being here today and also thanks for the organizers for letting me be here today because they have uh, they are caring a lot about uh, all the speakers. And uh, yeah, that's my name. I'm Jorge Castillo. I'm here to talk about functional programming over Android, over Kotlin and Android architecture. And uh, yeah, I'm working for Gomor. With it's a, can you hear me? It's an international company based in Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, but I'm working as a full-time remote worker from Spain, from a small city from the southeast of Spain. And uh, we have just a product app about ride sharing, car rental, and car leasing, okay? Let's, let's, I think there are some problems with sound from time to time, okay? Let's talk about functional programming, okay? First of all, just a bit, key concepts about this paradigm because I know we are not very familiarized with it because we are kind of used to, to, to apply Kotlin or Java or any other object-oriented languages, which are, of course, object uh, kind of object-oriented and we, not, we need uh, maybe some introduction to this to kind of feel a bit uh, better with it, okay? So uh, when we talk about functional programming, there are many things that we should be thinking about, but one of those, uh, some of those would be uh, constraint separation because you end up like declaring your whole execution tree across your different layers inside your architecture in a declarative way, but uh, deferring its execution. So it's not going to be run. It's like going to be wrapped inside of a package and we are kind of deferring its execution to a, a moment later on, okay? That would be uh, the second part of any app out there or any system out there, which would be the moment to actually run it and execute all the things inside of that kind of rough computation. That's very good for, for testing, for example. Uh, we also have purity, which is just about um, if I call a function 1,000 times and I pass the same parameter values every single time, I should get the same result every single time, okay? That means that the function is not doing any side effects, anything behind the scenes. It's just taking its parameters, playing with them, and providing a result. That's something good because that means determinism, okay? That's predictability inside our code. We don't really want to have side effects. Um, referential transparency is just about readability at the same time. If I, look at if, if I look at a function or I read a function and I look at its return types and input types, I should be able to know exactly what is it going to return. I, I, what, is, what is it asking for, okay? It has to be kind of very explicit about its uh, contract, usage contract, okay? And of course, pushing a state aside, okay? Because we don't like a state and we want to try to play with uh, pure purity all the time, okay? So we want to move or push that state to the edges of the system where the frameworks are bounded. So there are many features inside of Colin that are also, also can also be found in functional programming languages like high order functions, uh, functions as first class citizens, and uh, I don't know, uh, operator overloading type inference that can also be found in languages like uh, Haskell, for example. So it's not functional. I mean, Kotlin is, of course, is not a functional language by design, but it's open for that. But it still lacks some important features in functional programming that we really need to be able to play, uh, to play like completely, to use it completely, and uh, at its, its uh, full potential. Okay, like higher than uh, higher kind types, which is a very high level abstraction. We don't need to care a lot about its meaning for now. And for example, type classes, okay? We have a an of kind of an official proposal for Kotlin to include type classes inside of the language. They are kind of evaluating it, but it's still not done and we are not sure that they are gonna be there ever. So we hope they like the proposal and they, up, uh, they end up implementing it, uh, those, but uh, we still don't know. So we started thinking about creating a library over the language, which is uh, to provide um, data types and abstractions uh, to do functional programming over Kotlin, okay? It's inspired by some very well-known libraries in the functional programming world, like Scala, Scala set and uh, uh, ty uh, type level cats. And of course, it's open for public contribution, okay? People like Raul Raja or Paco Estevez uh, are contributing a lot on this library since day one, and we have been working on it for uh, around seven months, I think it is now. So it's a big work, but it's uh, starting to look very good and very close to a final stable release. 
So let's try to use the library to solve those very key problems that we can't find on any possible system out there. If we are playing with languages that uh, operate over the Java virtual machine, okay, which could be, for example, uh, the very usual problem about modeling error and success cases, because if your system needs to um, query an external source like a database or uh, an API client, uh, an API using an API client, you should be able to model those kind of successful results inside your system, inside your domain, but also the possible errors because those ex external uh, um, sources of data could be throwing errors like I/O exceptions or things like that. Okay. So both worlds need to be modeled inside your domain layer. There is also, of course, a synchronicity and threading, quite important. Side effects. We are playing with side effects all the time on object-oriented languages because that's very related to state. And, uh, and in object-oriented languages, we play with objects. So each object has his own memory state. So uh, they are kind of very prompt to having side effects. We are going to really need to care about those in functional programming because uh, one big concept inside of the paradigm is about removing those side effects inside the whole execution chain and try to kind of push them to the edges of the system, okay? Of course, dependency injection and testing. So let's uh, start uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the, very, the very first one, which would be modeling error and success cases, okay? If we think about the kind of vanilla approach that we have been doing for a long time in Java, uh, it could be something like this. I think the previous speaker has been talking about use cases. That could be a good, this could be a good example. We are going to fetch home heroes, so we have a use case wrapping that sort of bridge or domain logic inside of our domain layer. So we have the method that we are going to be calling to ask for a page of uh, heroes and a callback to provide results because it's going to be an uh, asynchronous call. Okay. So the data source, we are injecting a data source and also a logger, which could be an implementation uh, using Fabric or something. So we are going to be using the callback to provide the results. So the data source is going to be fetching the heroes. And then if everything goes all right, we will notify the, 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 list, the valid list of heroes to the previous thread, because we are most likely going to run this inside of a different thread, because it could be a complex computation or a long time uh, computation. But if anything goes wrong, uh, maybe you want to catch uh, those sort of exceptions pro uh, produced by the external source systems and then notify them using the callback. Maybe you want also log, uh, to log those errors using the Fabric Logger implementation, just in case you, you want to have some clues about what's happening in the domain layer errors in the future or whatever. But this doesn't look very good to me, OK, honestly, because First of all, we kind of need to wrap exceptions in the domain layer, and then we need to kind of map them to a different notify notification system uh, and notify the previous thread using a callback, for example. So we kind of have two different walls of prop uh, propagating the error here, and we need to switch or swap uh, between those just because exceptions do not surpass thread limits. If I just don't catch an exception here, and there is some presenter of view model uh, executing or calling a this code and run it in a diff on a different thread using a thread pool executor, for example, the error would get totally lost. I mean, it would never reach the presenter, okay? Because exceptions are not capable of surpassing thread limits. So the presenter could be waiting forever for a response, okay? So this is not pretty cool. And we also have a problem here because uh, we are kind of referential transparency because we cannot reflect in the return type of the method what is it going to return. We need to use a callback, and the callback is not saying anything an about the error type. So we need to get inside of the callback and look at the, its implementation to, d to notice that there is also a possibility that this function could be returning an error. So that's not ideal. Let's try an alternative which could be wrapping the result inside of some sort of wrapper class like this one. So let's just imagine a class where you have, I'm, I'm just putting here the constructor, wh where you can have maybe an error or maybe a success failure. You will have some maybe helper methods inside of it just to check if it's an error or not and then react in different ways depending on that. So that would be a wrapper type. Maybe we want to uh, declare our uh, error expected errors in the domain layer as an enum because we are still not using calling on this slide. So um, we could do something like that, maybe. We can just 
refactor the data source to return that sort of results, which, which is kind of very explicit about the possibility of returning an error or a list of heroes. So it's a bit better in terms of referential transparency. Uh, we can just check on that and log if it's needed, and either way, return the result. So we are kind of removing the callback and moving it to the return type, which is quite good. And it's also very explicit about the that duality that could be happening when I call this method. So it's impossible to me as a caller, if I'm the caller to this of this function, to miss the fact that some error could happen. Okay. But of course, I'm tricking here because it should this sh uh, this would uh, wouldn't ever work if uh, we are working with a synchronicity or threading. Okay, I can't just do this because uh, we need a, a synchronous code or at least and a, a way to declare this as is, as if it was synchronous, even if it's uh, still asynchronous. We don't have this system yet, but you are going to see it on the following slides. So let's ignore ignore that for now. There is also an alternative, uh, very usual one using Rx Java. So, for example, if, you have, if we have the uh, data source uh, API implementation using a Marvel API to get the heroes, and then we kind of construct uh, an observable, which is going to be constructed here using a single. Single is just an observable that is going to be dispatched just once. But what we are doing is preparing an observable that the moment an observer subscribes to it, what we are going to be doing is fetching the heroes. And if everything goes all right, we would be notifying about that, but if anything, any error happens or anything happens, we can also notify about that. I know that those on error are termination events and are, qu are quite not the best way to notify about errors on RxJava. You have other systems and operators to recover from errors and things like that, but that's not like the, the main point on this slide. So this is not very important. Let's just think that the data source implementation is going to be returning an observable where we can subscribe to. So the use case simple now because you can see things like this. You can do things like this. You can map over the, the, the observable and then, for example, add some business log logic on top of that. So the use case could be, for example, discarding some non-valid heroes that don't have valid uh, portrait images or whatever. And then you can also react to your two errors. And everything's kind of wrapped uh, on a single stream. So it's much better because you have a single stream of data where both concerns about error and success results uh, are model or included. It's a bit better, but then we don't have the error type inside of the result type uh, still. So that could be one of the bad points of it. But you could do something like using other d different types, like in the maybe type uh, or things like that. Okay, It's not that bad. And of course, you can uh, care about um, threading using the schedulers, which is very well integrated with the RxJava API. But let's start trying to solve the same, the same problem using category. All right. Uh, category brings to the table a new class which is called either. Either is like a maybe. It's just about uh, a disjunction. What it's telling to you that is that it could be an, a left or a right. So it kind of contains two different uh, values because it's a sealed class. So in e every moment or any moment in time, it could be just the type on the left or the type on the right, but never both of them. So it's clearly telling you that it's going to be one thing or the other one, with no exceptions. So let's uh, start using Kotlin now. We have n our kind of uh, domain exceptions or errors model as a shield class, because we just have a bunch of them, a shield hierarchy of those errors. So a shield class is a good way to model those. And we can do a new implementation on the data source, which is quite different. What we are going to be doing is passing the dependencies as uh, function parameters. That's very functional uh, style. We are going to be fetching characters using the service. And then the result, which is going to be like a collection of hero D in network DTOs or something like that, we probably want to map it, that collection, to a collection of domain model heroes. Okay, Because we don't really want to play with network DTOs across our different layers. We don't want the network DTOs to get inside of the domain layer. Okay. So what we are going to be doing is get that whole result, which is a valid and already mapped uh, to the main uh, collection of heroes. We are going to be wrapping it inside of a write. Write is the right side of either. Okay. If you can remember, it's, it's a sealed class, which can have uh, two values, left or right. And by convention, Either classes inside functional programming always have the error type on the left and the success type on the right. So if it's a successful value, like this case, I would be returning a right in uh, wrapping that value. 
But if anything happens, any possible exception, I'm going to convert it to uh, one of the errors defined on this silk class, and then I'm going to wrap it inside of a left. Because the left is, is the error type, OK? So this class is very good in terms of referential transparency, because it's clearly saying, I can return either an error or a valid list of heroes. Very explicit. OK? So the use case can look very simple now because we can just apply a fault function over the either being returned by the use by the data source. It's returning an either, and I can apply the fault function. And faulting over that means that uh, I need to pass two different lambdas, which are just going to be applied depending if it's an error or a success value. So the first lambda is for the error type. Maybe I want to log it and then return it as it was because the error was a left. So I need to kind of wrap it again. But if it was a success, I just let it be as it was. I don't, I don't do anything with it, OK? And keep moving. So we're folding over the either to apply different effects depending on the case, OK? Pr the presenter or the view model who is kind of calling the, this code could be very simple again, because simple again because it also can fold over the either being returned by the use case at the same time and apply different view rendering effects uh, or view rendering orders for the view contract depending on the case. So again, the same problem being solved in, in the same way. You can forget about all the arguments I'm passing in uh, manually on each one of those levels because we are going to get rid of those with some uh, interesting systems in the following slides. Okay, Just forget about them for now, please. So what we are going to be doing, uh, if you can see here, those are the methods we are using to render the errors or the, or the valid list of heroes on the screen. So we are going to tell the view to render those. So about the errors, what we are doing is just the matching over the error type that we have inside of a SIL class. So we kind of uh, can be uh, get, get the benefits from exhaustive evaluation that we have from calling when statements where we are playing with SIL classes. And we also have our kind of implicit castings, thanks to, to the one statement. So depending on the case of the error, what we are going to be doing is applying a different effect, as you can see on the view, like showing a snap bar, a dialog, or whatever. Or maybe just closing the screen, or whatever we, we think it's good for the business or for the product. And in terms of the valid list of heroes, what we are going to be doing is maybe rendering it. And maybe we, we want to map it to some kind of renderable models, which could be simpler. Uh, if we don't need the whole domain model inside of the view implementation, okay? Because maybe we are just going to be rendering, rendering a picture and the name or something like that. And that's all we need. But uh, still, we are kind of tricking here because we still didn't say anything about uh, threading and, and uh, synchronicity. We need to do something with that because we are playing like in a very imperative way. So we are just requesting some function execution and getting the return type from them or the return value from them, but that's not playing very good with threading and asynchronicity. So there are up to date, or until this very moment, we have some different alternatives to solve this. Like, as a brief, uh, brief recap, remember that for the vanilla Java approach, we were using Threadpool Executor and uh, accept exceptions and callbacks for mapping errors. Rx Java was more about using schedulers. That was very simple plus observable and error subscription. And uh, on category, we are going to be doing something different. Because what we have, what we really, in, at the end of the day, have here is a computation that is going to be applied uh, to, a to a, an external data source, for example, uh, an API client uh, querying an API, or uh, maybe the implementation of the data source could be querying a database or whatever. So. It's like an external computation. It's an I.O. computation. And we need to wrap that inside of an I.O. monad, OK? You can forget about the monad world, because I'm obviously not going to be talking about monads here. This is not a functional programming event, and it wouldn't add a lot of value. What I really want is you guys to have this like crystal clear. The I.O. computation is going to wrap a computation that it's a side effect. It's a computation that is going to be querying something external, or some external systems, or whatever. Uh, so we kind of run to wrap those side effects inside I.O. to make them pure. That means that we are deferring that side effect execution. We are kind of going to wrap it inside of a package and use it as a pure value. And later on, when we are ready to run it, we will explicitly tell it, this is the moment to unfold. You can apply all your side effects. But not until that very moment. Okay. 
So that's going to help us to make that, that kind of I.O. computation very explicit in the return type. So we kind of keep making our type grow here. We have the either, which could be an error or a valid list of heroes, which is going to be wrapped inside of an I.O. now. So this clearly means this I.O. is wrapping a computation, which is the third in time, which could be returning either an error or a valid list of heroes. So this is modeling uh, different things instead of the same type. The IO computation plus the duality about what could be return, what could it be returning. So the network data source implementation could look like this now. We can use a function to run this in a, in a synchronous context using calling coroutines or whatever we want. But what we are going to be doing is querying the, the, the API using this function. And then if some error happens, we, for example, would want to log it, map it to a character error because it's going to be a throwable, what I'm getting from the API. It could be an I.O. exception, and I want to map it to a character error. What I'm using here is just an ex extension function that I added just, just for syntax or syntactic sugar. But this is returning the same throwable already mapped to a character error, which is one of the errors, if you can remember, that we were modeling using our seal class inside our domain layer. And in the end, that kind of already mapped error, I'm going to lift it. It's called, uh, it's called lifting. I'm going to lift it to a left value, which means I'm going to wrap it inside of a left. This is another extension function just for, for syntax. So what I'm returning is a left wrapping the error on that case. But if everything goes all right, I kind of do the same. I map the heroes to some domain models, and then I'm going to wrap it inside of a right value because it's a success. So it's a right. It should be. Uh, this value, okay, the, the one on the right. You can ignore this because this is just about the syntax on category and we are kind of passing an asynchronous context to, to, to kind of force this to run in a different thread and as an asynchronous task. You don't need to care about that now. But please look at this. I mean, the result type is really explicit. It's clearly saying this is an IO computation. This is a computation that I'm deferring in time, which could be returning either an error or a valid list of heroes again. So the use case, it's easy again, but this time, what we get back from the uh, data source is an IO. It's not an either anymore. It's an IO wrapping an either. So I need to map twice. That's not very cool, right? I mean, I need to map twice because the first mapping is going to return me the either. I mean, and here I'm going to be playing with the either. And I map the either again to discard the valid here, the non-valid heroes. The either is a class that we say it's like right biased. That means that any methods like map, flat map, and so on are playing over its right side always. So the left side on the, er on the either, which would be the error here, is not really being affected by those methods. Okay? It's just being passed on level by level. Presentation logic would be doing something interesting because we kind of get the either, sorry, the IO back from this because it's uh, still returning an, I, an IO. You can see it here, wrapping an either. So we, we are deciding to apply side effects now. This is the moment with we, what we were talking about before. This is the moment for me to say, hey, I want the IO to resolve and to apply its effects. Okay, because I want to access its, its inner values and do different things depending on that. So I get access, I, I, I tell it explicitly to run and unfold um, and run, actually execute its uh, inner computation, and then the result would be folded again to apply different effects depending on the case, okay? But this is not ideal because I don't really like to apply side effects inside my presenter or my view model or whoever is calling the use case. What I will want to do is something different, okay? Ideally, I will really want to push those side effects uh, to the edge of the system where the frameworks are bound, which in Android obviously means the view implementation, okay? I want to kind of let the view decide when si side effects are going to be applied. So this is still the rest of my architecture is going to be completely pure, okay? Completely avoiding side effects. Solutions for this. We can apply something very, s very simple or very common in functional programming, which is lazy evaluation, okay? So we are just going to defer all the things, yeah. Right, so we can just start returning function on each one of those levels inside our architectures. architecture. So if any step inside our architecture is modeled to return a function instead of the already computed value, that means it's going to be returning something expecting to get run, but it's still not run. So that's very related to functional programming. 
So we can try to compose our whole execution tree doing this. For example, the presenter method could be returning a function, which is saying, hey, if I get my dependencies passed in, then I will be able to do something. The use case can be doing the same. The network the, the data source can be doing the same. And in the end, it's going to the moment it gets it finally its dependencies, it's going to be able to take some dependency from inside of that data class or whatever and use it. So the whole computation tree is now kind of deferred in time. It's still not run. It's if you call the presenter method from the view implementation, you are going to get a computation which is still not run. It's just a function waiting to be run. But passing in the dependencies all the way down across the different uh, layers, it's not very cool. We would really want to avoid that in some way. Can, can't we kind of implicitly pass them or inject them in, in any way? And yes, we can. OK? So we can use something which is quite cool, and it's called a reader monad, which is just a very weird name to say, uh, I'm going to wrap a computation and defer it in time. Just forget about the monad war again. But the IO, sorry, the reader is going to wrap a computation that it's going to have this type. So it's going to be wrapping a function. And the, its type is going to be, I need some dependencies to work. And when I get them, I'm going to return some valid value, which is the A type. So this is the dependency here. And this, uh, this is called the reader context. OK? Uh, its operations uh, or its dependencies are going to be implicitly passed which is exactly what we want to do, if we wrap all our operations inside of a reader. So if you want the, to think about the context of the reader in some way to have it uh, more clear, I would think about all those dependencies that you need to run the whole execution tree and are applying side effects. So for example, the threading implementation, which is going to switch threads, the, the data source implementation, or the view implementation used to, ren to render side effects on a screen, all those things should be passed inside of the dependencies of the reader or included inside of the dependencies of the reader because I want to have the power to switch them at tests Okay, later on. It has some weaknesses because even if it's solving the problem of deferring function execution or computation execution and also implicitly passing dependencies, which is very cool, it's not capable of uh, playing with what uh, functional programming calls uh, 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 computations returning monadic values, which is just either option, IO, and so on. The reader is not able to play with that. So we need something a bit more powerful, but implementing the same kind of uh, concept or solution. So that's what the why the Claysley exists. Claysley is just like an improved reader, OK? You can. Uh, it's frequently called reader transformer or reader t using a type alias. And we are going to be using it. OK? Same result we had until now. We are going to wrap it inside of a reader. So what we are doing now is say, I have a deferred, IO, a deferred computation, which is going to be an IO computation that could be either returning an error or a, or a list of heroes. This is starting to look a bit uh, weird. <laughs> OK? This is not very readable, I know. But we will find a solution for this, OK? So for now, we can implement our data source implementation doing something like this. It's cool because the, the return type is exactly doing what we wanted to do, OK? It's going to be a reader wrapping the computation. But now we are doing something interesting because we don't need to pass the dependencies explicitly anymore. We kind of get magic, magical access to them or automa automatical access to them. And for that, we are calling an interesting function inside of the reader companion, which is, which is the ask function. The ask function can be called statically, statically, like we are doing here. And then it's going to automatically wrap a computation with the type, uh, with this type. If I get a D, I'm going to be returning a D. It's like a trick. So what we get is access to that D, which would be the context of the reader automatically. If we map over that, we can access to the context and use it to do the same computation that we were doing before which is exactly the same, but this time it's using the context, if you can see here and here, to get access to the side effect uh, dependencies that we have inside of it. So by doing this, we avoid passing dependencies explicitly at each one of those levels. And uh, the use case wouldn't need to change at all. But this time, it would be returning a reader transformer. And the view, uh, sorry, the presenter uh, could look like this. 
we again ask to lift up a reader from the context value, so we kind of flat map over it and we get access to the context. This, instead of the parentheses, is the context itself. But I'm applying a data class of construction, which is just a feature inside the language, to get rapid access to its properties. Okay? So I'm getting access to one of the dependencies included in it, which would be the view contract. Okay? And I want to do exactly the same thing I was doing before. Okay, but now I have access to that depend to those dependencies thanks to the reader. Okay, and dependencies are also explicitly passed in. I don't need to pass them anymore. And the computation is diverted in time because we are returning a reader. Its side effects are not really being applied on the presenter; are just being modeled. Computations are, are being declarative modeled here, but not run. So the view implementation can do something like just ignore this lines can do something like this. If we are, for example, in the on resume callback from the Android activity or whatever, we can just get the reader coming back from the presentation layer and tell it to explicitly run. This is the moment where we say in the, implement the view implementation, it's, it's the moment to run everything. Okay? I just want to get rid of all the purity because I'm on one of uh, the other side of the boundaries right now and I'm ready to pass you all the dependencies wrapped inside of a context and run the whole chain using that. So the whole chain will automatically unfold and use that context to evaluate each one of the steps. Of course, the context could be a data class including all the dependencies. It doesn't need to be very complex. Okay. On testing scenarios, since I want to switch some of those dependencies, I just need to pass a different context which is smoking some of those dependencies, okay? So the context could easily be thought uh, like uh, the dagger graphs, for example, okay? It's gonna be the dependency binding, so the dependency tree with all the already resolved dependencies. Okay, so it's looking good. Um, uh, but we need to get rid of the, all those nested types that we had before in some way. So we are gonna be using something very cool, which is uh, because do monads do not compose very gracefully when you have different types of monads on your stack. So we are going to be using something called monad transformers. Okay, monad transformers is just a way to give already already existing monads with new powers. Okay, so if I, I have an IO, I can uh, kind of give them uh, give the IO with the powers of an either also and make it work like if it was also uh, either an either or an IO. Okay. So we were already using one transformer, which was the reader, but what we really want to achieve is this stack. We want to have an IO kind of gifted with the powers of either and kind of gift the result with the powers of reader. So in the end, we are going to have like a super type, which is going to be able to do to resolve all the concerns we had on our stack. OK? We can call it as in result or whatever we want. OK? So this type is going to wrap all our concerns in a very single type, not three different nested levels, which was our main problem there. OK, so this would be the data source network implementation now. We can just use something which is just syntactic sugar, and we are providing for the, for the first time over calling using category, which are the monad bindings, which are just part, part of monad comprehensions. It's like the do notation in Haskell. It's like a different structure which is making us capable of a, a kind of declare a, sec a sequence of different asynchronous computation, like if they were synchronous, actually. Okay, so it's just about syntactic sugar. I have some lines here, but I could run more asynchronous code like, li like this one after it, as many as I need, and uh, I could be doing, doing it sequentially. And in the end, I'm going to get a flat map result inside of the context of the async result, getting the final result. So it's returning an async result with wrapping the final result. Okay? So we will be running each one of those tasks as if they were synchronous. Okay? The, the use case doesn't need to change anything, but this time it's even better because we don't need to map twice anymore because we don't have nested monads anymore. We just have one type, which is wrapping all the concerns. So we can get act uh, access to its actual wrap value just by mapping ones, which is quite better. 
and presentation code doesn't need to change at all. Uh, it can look pretty easy, pretty simple like that one, okay? And again, we still have the power to decide inside of the view implementation when the side effects are going to be run or applied. So again, on testing scenarios, we can apply the same strategy. We provide a different context to run the whole chain, but this time it's going to be providing some mocks again, okay? Pretty nice. So apart from all this stack that we have been building to solve our, uh, our concerns, there are some extra bullets that we are going to be talking very briefly about. So uh, one of those uh, would be Tagless Final and also Free Monads. Those are just like two very advanced functional programming styles. We are not going to be talking in deep about this here because it's not like the event to talk about those styles. And I don't have time either for that. But just a very brief explanation. Tagless Final is about declaring our ho uh, your whole execution tree or your whole execution train uh, chain, uh, not using concrete classes uh, like uh, IO, reader, either, but using type classes. Type classes define behaviors, okay? It's more or less like an interface that can be applied on a bunch of different types, over a bunch of different types. So if we define our whole execution tree based on behaviors, then we can pass the implementation details later on, okay, to decide about that. So our whole execution tree is defined depending on abstractions and not on concretions. You have uh, a graded model implemented that is styling the sample repo and also a pull request describing the problem in a very good way, okay? And free monads is uh, more or less the same concept, but uh, what we are going to be using is free. Free is like a way to wrap a computation and say, and declare it in a completely abstract way, okay? So what we do is composing something called the abstract syntax tree, which is gonna be all those nested computations, but all of those are gonna be um, applied using free. Uh, sorry, so on each one of those levels, we are gonna be returning free containing a computation. So thanks to that, we are not declaring any semantics or uh, implementation details until the very last moment when an interpreter can take our program, which is defined in terms of free. So it's completely abstract and then provide it with the implementation details. So the, the, the interpreter is going to be in charge of pro providing those details or semantics to your program. And until that moment, your program is completely abstract. Okay. Free can replace easily dependency injection because we are deferring the implementation details for a, for, for a later moment in time. So dependency injection, it's not needed anymore. If you want to test anything composed uh, by free instances, you just need to use a different interpreter passing different implementation details, like mocks, mocks for all, all the dependencies or whatever you want. You have all the documentation in the sample repo and also a greater model implementing the same Android app, but using the free, free monads style, okay? So some very fast conclusions about this. The patterns we learned today are, can be easily applied over any possible platform and system because what we are solving is a completely generic problem, like dependence injection, okay? You could have the same exact patterns on your backend side or, or front-end side or whatever you are using Kotlin, of course. But if you're not using Kotlin and you're using Scala or Haskell, you can still apply these in concepts because our, these concepts are uh, wrapping solutions for completely generic problems, okay? You can also share concepts and you even the glossary and talk, talk with other teams about the same strategies. So all of you are very well aligned. It also means money inside of companies, you know? So um, also functional programming is really about fixing things once and not doing it again ever. So if you can fix dependency injection in your Android app, and that's also valid for your backend and your frontend and everything, you can just make a library and reuse that without any problem. So you have all the samples of all the styles of functional programming that we have been uh, talking about today inside of the sample repo. You have the same application four times, uh, implemented four times, and each one of those is implementing a different approach. The big one would be, or the one we have been talking more about would be the nested monad approach. Then if you can remember, we kind of improved it using the monad transformance approach. 
And then you also have tagless final and free moments, okay? The application is very simple. It's like rendering, querying the Marvel API for a bunch of heroes, rendering them on a screen, and you then you have also access to its details and things like that, okay? Thank you. Could you talk a little bit more about the maturity of category, if it's like production already yeah. or? Hmm. Uh, we are moving very fast towards a uh, final stable release. We are pretty close. About features, I think it's very, very close to a release, but we are still working on documentation. So if you get inside of category.io, you will see a lot of documentation and API, public API references mentioning all the type classes and everything. And you can see explicit uh, examples of all those encoding snippets of all those values. And it's pretty cool because we are also running and validating the documentation at the same time using some kind of advanced technique. So all the snippets on the documentation and are actually compiled using category and validated. So it's always going to be up to date with the last version of the library. Uh, so in the Thanks for the talk, it was great. Um, in the wrapping monad approach, you add Sorry? An in the, the wrapping monads oh approach. Oh, yeah, nesting okay, monads. And, yeah. and then uh, nesting monads, yes. And hmm. then you put it into inside an IO. Yeah. And then you wanted this uh, dependency injection and you used the reader T. Why yep. not just reader? Uh, maybe I went so fast through that, but the reader itself is not capable of wrapping computations that return monadic values. So if your computation is a function that returns an IO or an either, reader is not able to play with that because reader is not able to play with higher kind types, okay? That's why you kind of upgrade it to Claysley, which is just the same but with those new powers. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, Thanks. I have one uh, question about um, because a big problem of Rx Java is that mm. it is in Java, so it is not it, it is not designed for the common modules. If we would want to make common module both both for uh, Android and for iOS, mm. um, but uh, uh, but this uh, the category is written in in Kotlin. Is it mm. prepared to be used in the common modules? Like to reuse it on different systems? Uh, for example, the problems are with threads. Is it like yeah. using the Kotlin threads or uh, oh yeah. maybe coroutines mm. or uh, mm -hmm. instead the uh, Java threads? Mm. Yeah, uh, if you look at my examples, all the de implementation details are provided, are just uh, provided by me when I'm uh, writing my app, which is in Android. So the library is not abstracting implementation details. That would be an error. The library is just ab abstracting pure Kotlin. So if you are using Kotlin in other systems, like backend, you could reuse the same classes and everything, okay? Nice. Thanks. <laughs>